anybody that studies British politics or reads the news will know and be aware that many high-ranking members of the British government and hierarchy have been connected to dark paedophile rings, despite these connections being dismissed as nothing more than a conspiracy theory by David Cameron. The evidence seems to tell a different story. Jimmy Savile was a blatant paedophile rapist and psychopath. And police, politicians, media, all media, not just the BBC, and victims knew exactly what he was doing. So why did nobody report him or arrest him? The reason he was not exposed by his victims is obvious, fear, but what about the police? At least one policeman did want to arrest Jimmy Savile, but he claims he was told to stay away by senior figures in the police force. When asked why, he was told Jimmy Savile has friends in high places. So who are these friends in high places that were obviously protecting Jimmy Savile? The reason that Jimmy Savile was not arrested is according to some researchers simple, he was a collector of children for establishment figures. People like Leon Britton, Sir Cyril Smith and many other politicians, lords, monarchs and members of the aristocracy. It sounds unbelievable, but does it sound as unbelievable as the fact that he was allowed to carry on acting this way for at least four decades without ever being exposed or arrested? As well as children and disabled people, Jimmy Savile also is known to have committed necrophilia. He is obviously a very disturbed individual. Bill Oddie tells us everybody knew about Jimmy Savile at the BBC. Which could be true because he was banned from children in need and nearly exposed by John Lydon of the Sex Pistols in the 1980s who claimed that he was ordered to shut up and he was again exposed by the funny as fuck Chris Morris in the 1990s as well as David Icke. Louis Ferrou asked Jimmy Savile in a documentary made in 2000 about the rumours which Jimmy Savile denied at the time. media are presenting the information as if Jimmy Savile was working alone, but the fact is that if he was working alone he would have been caught and prosecuted much earlier. A cover up of this scale would have involved thousands of people in media, hospitals, police and even government. So Civil Smith was a British Liberal Member of Parliament for Rochdale. After his death, numerous allegations of child sexual abuse by Smith emerged, 
including many made during his lifetime, leading police to believe that Smith was a serial sex offender. In 2015, it emerged that Smith had been arrested in the 1980s in relation to these offences, but a high-level cover-up reportedly led him to being released within hours. The evidence was destroyed and investigating officers were prevented from discussing the matter under the Official Secrets Act. During the 1960s, Smith was active on many of Rochdale's council committees regarding youth activities. These included Rochdale's Youth Orchestra, Rochdale's Youth Theatre Workshop, the governorship of 29 Rochdale schools, and the chairmanship of a youth committee, youth employment committee and education committee. The 29 star politician was accused of eight counts of sexual abuse, including six offences at a care home he set up in Rochdale. He was also protected by people in high places, including MI5 and Special Branch. After Leon Britton died in January 2015, he was accused of multiple child rape. Labour MP Tom Watson said that he had spoken to two people who claimed that they had been abused by Britton, including a man who alleged he had been attacked more than a dozen times as a boy. The alleged victim also said that he had seen Britton assault others. Watson said that he, along with others, including media organisations, had known of the accusations but had decided not to speak out of fear of prejudicing any jury trial that Britain might have one day faced. He was made Queen's Counsel in 1978. Between 1979 and 1981, he was a Minister of State at the Home Office and then he was promoted to become Chief Secretary of the Treasury, becoming the youngest member of the Cabinet. He warned Cabinet colleagues that spending on social security, health and education would have to be cut whether they liked it or not. In government documents released in July 2015, Britain was one of the four senior Westminster figures named in connection with child sex abuse but the context of the reference is not known. Along with Britain, the former British diplomat Sir Peter Heyman and former ministers William Van Streisenby and Peter Morrison were named in secret government files after a review into historical child sex abuse. Ralph Harris was a singer, artist and a children's TV presenter that worked for the BBC, a man that I once met and I could not stand. He received a number of awards and honours. Following his conviction, many of these were rescinded. For example, he was appointed a member of the Order of the British Empire in 1968. He was advanced to an officer of the Order of the British Empire in 1977 and then to commander in 2006 but these honours were revoked in March 2015. In 2014 at the age of 84 he was jailed for 12 counts of indecent assault that took place between sometime in 1968 and 1986 on four female victims then aged between 8 and 19. Since then other victims have come forward. The Duke of York and Buckingham Palace strenuously denied the allegations in court documents in the USA that he had sexually abused a 17-year-old girl who she claimed was used as a sex slave. This is rare as the monarchs do not usually deny or acknowledge any of the allegations. Judge Kenneth Mara 
ordered Virginia Roberts' accusations about Andrew, the Duke of York, to be struck from record and denied her attempt to join the lawsuit against Geoffrey Epson, a friend of the Prince and a convicted sex offender. In 2008, Geoffrey Epson was convicted of soliciting an underage girl for prostitution, for which he served 13 months in prison. This photo of Prince Andrew walking in Central Park with Epson shortly after Epson's release forced the Duke to quit his role as the British government's global trade envoy. Geoffrey Epson is well connected. Sir Peter Morris was a British Conservative politician and MP for Chester from 1974 to 1992 and Parliamentary Private Secretary to Prime Minister Margaret Thatcher. In October 2012, Rod Richards, a former MP and ex-leader of the Welsh Conservatives, implicated Morrison in the North Wales child sex abuse scandal. Between 1974 and 1990, up to 650 children from 40 children's homes were sexually, physically and emotionally abused. Richard said that Morrison and another high profile conservative politician were named in the documents as regular and unexplained visitors to the care home. Investigative journalist Nick Davis reported in The Guardian that Morrison received a caution for cottaging with underage boys in public lavatories. In 2002, Covey described Morrison as a notable pedagogist. In an article written by Giles Brandreff and published in the Daily Mail in September 2014, Giles Brandreff said, What did Mrs. Thatcher know of his alleged dark side? When I talked to her about him, I felt she had the measure of the man. She knew he was homosexual and she knew he was a drinker. She was fond of him, clearly, but told me that he had ruined himself through self-indulgence, much as Reginald Moulding had done a generation earlier. When it came to the love lives of her colleagues, Mrs Thatcher was not judgmental. She was quite ready to forgive Cecil Parkinson for his affair with Sarah Keys. But I'm not so sure she would have countenanced a child abuser as her parliamentary private secretary, let alone have authorised a cover-up on his behalf. The Daily Mail tells us that it seems unlikely that Mrs Thatcher knew of the rumoured tendencies, much less likely covered them up. In July 2014, Barry Strevens, a former bodyguard to Margaret Thatcher, claimed that he warned her that Morrison allegedly held sex parties with underage boys. Strevens said that despite passing on the allegations to Thatcher, she later promoted Morrison to the position of Deputy Chairman of the Conservative Party. Thatcher's private secretary, Archie Hamilton, reportedly took notes of what was said. Louis Mountbatten, also known as Lord Mountbatten, first Earl Mountbatten of Burma, was a British naval officer and statesman, an uncle of Prince Philip, the Duke of Edinburgh, and second cousin once removed to Elizabeth II. In April 1990, a writer called Robert Robinson, also known as Robin Bryans, stated in a Dublin-based magazine called Now 
that Lord Mountbatten, Anthony Blunt and others were all involved in an old boy network which held gay orgies in country houses on both sides of the Irish border, as well as at the Kinkora Boys' Home. Arbinson sent letters and postcards to the rich and powerful in the British establishment circles, but once the postcards began to circulate, there were complaints to the police and Arbinson was warned that he would be prosecuted for criminal libel. The Belfast newsletter reported that the files on King Cora's boys' home were conspicuously absent from the routine January 2013 release of 1982 government papers by the Public Record Office of Northern Ireland under the 30-year rule. Lord Mountbatten is reported to be the man that introduced Jimmy Savile to the Royals' inner circles. The following is an extract from the Express article from 2008 on Jimmy Savile and Lord Mountbatten. The fact that Jimmy Savile rarely spends two consecutive nights in the same bed is one of the reasons he has no interest in marriage, but there is only ever been one woman in his life. His mother, Agnes, nicknamed the Duchess, who died in 1973. He lived with her for her last 16 years and he described the five days he spent alone with her body after her death as the best of his life. He said, I'm a lot of a loner, I've always been like that, though I don't know why. I haven't worked it out myself. All I know is that I am what I am. People find it odd, I find it odd. He was first introduced to the royal family, he reveals, by Lord Mountbatten in 1966. Jimmy became the first civilian to be awarded a Royal Marines Green Barrett. Mountbatten was Commandant General at the time and realised that Savile could be a useful contact. Coming from Lord Lewis, who was the favourite uncle of Prince Philip, that was saying something. He says, so obviously I hooked up with the Prince. He donated proceeds from signed photos of himself with Elvis to the Duke of Edinburgh's National Playing Fields Association and Philip returned the compliment in the 80s to raise money for the National Spinal Injury Centre at Stoke Mandalay, which was Sir Jimmy's pet project. In 1991, a writer named Andrew Morton identified him as the unlikely royal peacemaker between Charles and Diana, adding as unofficial court jester, he articulates opinions courtiers can only think of. He claims that he spent 11 consecutive Christmases with the Thatchers at Chequers. He says of the former Premier, I knew the real woman and the real woman was something else. The times I spent up there, Dennis, me and her shoes off in front of the fire. The strangest stroke of apparent influence was when Jimmy Savile met the Israeli President on his first visit to Jerusalem in 1975. I'm very disappointed because you've forgotten how to be Jewish and that's why everyone is taking you to the cleanness, Sir Jimmy told him. You won the Six Day War, you took all the land, you gave it all back including the only oil well in the area and now you're paying the Egyptians for oil that you've already had he said to the president. He says the president asked him to come and say the same thing to the cabinet, which he duly did. 
they asked my opinion about a couple of things to which I says nothing's impossible they did exactly what I suggested and it worked out 100% Lord Greville Janna was a Labour British politician, barrister, writer and member of the House of Lords. He was alleged to have abused vulnerable children and he died before court proceedings could formally establish the facts. In 1991, the director of a children's arm in Leicestershire, Frank Beck, was convicted of child abuse over 13 years to 1986 and sentenced to five life terms. During the trial, Beck accused Jenna of having abused a child and a witness said that while he was in care, Jenna had abused him. Jenna could not say that Beck was lying until after the trial because that would have been contempt of court. John Enoch Powell, best known as Enoch Powell, was a British politician, classical scholar, theologist and poet. He served as a Conservative Member of Parliament and in the Oyster Union Party from 1974 to 1987 and Minister of Health from 1960 to 1963. In 2002, Powell appeared 55th on the list of the 100 greatest Britons of all time voted for by the public in a BBC nationwide poll. Enoch Powell, the conservative anti-immigrant firebrand, is being investigated as an alleged member of a claimed Westminster paedophile network after his name was supplied to the police by a senior Anglican bishop. The name of the late MP, one of the most divisive politicians of the 20th century, was provided to Scotland Yard after a clergyman came forward with claims from the 1980s relating to ritual satanic abuse. Mr Pohl, a maverick politician, is the latest senior parliamentarian to be made the subject of police inquiries into alleged establishment sex rings. The Metropolitan Police has several outgoing investigations relating claims to suspended abusers, including the former Liberal MP Civil Smith. The detectives are also investigating against former Home Secretary Leon Britton, the Independent reports. According to the Independent, the claims made against Ian Uppal were passed to the police by the Right Reverend Paul Butler, the Bishop of Durham more than one year ago, but have only now, in March 2015, been made public. In July 2014, the Daily Mail reported an MP in Tony Blair's government was part of a paedophile ring which infiltrated a council children's home where an award-winning author was abused in care it was claimed. Alex Whittle, 51, said he was attacked at the Shirley Oaks home in Surrey which took youngsters from Lambeth in South London. After moving there as a three-year-old a doctor abused him during an appointment where he was forced to strip naked while he said that a swimming instructor, a football coach, and even staff groped and even raped boys and girls. Mr Whittle was also beaten with hairbrushes, belts and boots. Suffering violence was as much a part of my day as eating toast, he said. The father of three said that the abuse was covered up when a Labour MP was named 
as being an alleged member of a network of child abusers targeting the borough. Mr Whittle, who was attacked at the Shirley Oaks near Croydon in the 1980s, where the politician also visited regularly in the same period. The author was handed an MBE by the Queen in 2009. He said paedophiles also targeted the South Vale Centre in Lambeth, where children were assessed before being sent to Shirley Hawks. Describing his life in there, he told the Daily Mirror he would see strange nameless men within the Shirley Hawks ground. I'm convinced there was a paedophile ring operating in South Vale and Shirley Hawks, and that the authorities knew about it at the time but did nothing. According to the ITCCS website, Queen Elizabeth II had direct involvement in the kidnapping and death of Aboriginal children. Royal family members also appeared to regularly participate in the Ninth Circle Satanic Cults rituals at Mohawk Indian School in Brentford, Ontario, Canada. The International Tribunal into Crimes of Church and State was asking concerned citizens to demand Vivian Cunningham's immediate release. The ITCCS claimed to have successfully prosecuted Queen Elizabeth's kidnapping along with 50,000 cases of other missing children. As usual there has been a complete media blackout of this story along with many others. The order to arrest Queen Elizabeth II was apparently issued in 2013 by six judges of the International Common Law Court of Justice in Brussels. Regiment soldier Vivian Cunningham had innocently questioned a senior officer about the Queen's arrest warrant, only to be committed to a mental care unit in Stafford, England. It was injected with a typical antipsychotic drug, a lanzapin, under the orders of Captain Marvell and Doctors Kahn and Seema. The soldier was committed for six months to St George's psychiatric unit with a diagnosis of suffering from an acute psychotic episode. James Stewart Hall worked as a TV presenter for the BBC. He was appointed as Officer of the Order of the British Empire in 2012 for services to broadcasting and charity. But the order was formally annulled by Queen Elizabeth II in October 2013 due to his conviction of sex offences. The Dame Janet Smith Review, released on the 25th of February 2016, found that all had assaulted at least 21 female victims at the BBC, the youngest of whom was 10. Between 1967 and 1991, the report found that some BBC staff were aware he was bringing underage girls into his dressing room for sex, but he was seen as untouchable due to his celebrity status, and this prevented them from passing the complaints to senior management. Other people involved include Max Clifford, Dave Lee Travis, Chris Jenning, Gary Glitter and Michael Salmon, a medical doctor at Stoke Mandalay Hospital where Savile allegedly abused many of his victims. There does seem to be a huge cover-up going on from missing documents, calls from the MI5 and Special Branch and Parliament itself to release suspects and the cover-up has now evolved to internet censorship, social media sites like Facebook, Google+, Twitter, YouTube and others have been aggressively censoring this kind of material and subject for years and effectively silencing victims. 
but the cover-up also involves mainstream media. A friend and retired BBC worker said that the late Crime Watch host, Jill Dando, was told DJs, celebrities and other staff were involved in organised abuse. But the anonymous source says no one wanted to know. Miss Dando raised concerns about the alleged ring and other sexual abuse claims at the BBC. Jill Dando is said to have passed a file to a senior management in the 1990s, but they never carried out an investigation. The 37-year-old TV presenter was shot dead on the 26th of April 1999 on the doorstep of her home in West London. The crime remains unsolved. The anonymous source said I don't recall the names of all the stars now and I don't want to implicate anyone but Jill said they were surprisingly big names. I think she was quite shocked when told about the images of children and that the information on how to join this horrible paedophile ring was freely available. Jill said others had complained to her about sexual matters and that some female workmates also claimed that they had been groped or assaulted. Nothing had been done and there seemed to be a policy of turning a blind eye. The former colleagues said female BBC staff confided in Jill, one of the best known TV faces of the day after frontlining primetime shows including Holiday and the 6 o'clock news as well as Crime Watch. Miss Dando joined a campaign to help the children spot paedophiles a year before she died. She had received death threats putting the BBC in lockdown with armed guards patrolling the television centre in London. Her death sparked one of the biggest murder hunts in British history. Barry George was found guilty in 2001, but his conviction was quashed in 2008. Did Jill Dando die because of what she knew? BBC's website tell us parts of the media, particularly the online alternative media, raced down the road publishing wild stories without pausing to check if they were true. A lot of things that have been published should have never been. The BBC is definitely not part of that media because they have just simply ignored the problem for years, as well as they cover it up. In a candid interview for the BBC in 1995, Tim Fortescue, a former Conservative Party Chief Whip, described the grubby calculations routinely applied within elite political circles. He said, anyone with any sense who was in trouble would come to the whips and tell them the truth and say, now I'm in a jam, can you help? It might be debt, it might be a scandal involving small boys or any kind of scandal which a member seemed likely to be mixed up in. They'd come and ask if we could help. And if we could, we did. We would do everything we could because we would store up brownie points. That sounds like a pretty nasty reason, but one of the reasons is if we get a chap out of trouble He'll do what we ask forevermore.
In February 2015, The Guardian reported that MI5 and MI6 have been accused of covering up the scandal. The report goes on to say that MI5 is facing allegations it was complicit in the sexual abuse of children. A High Court in Northern Ireland will hear on Tuesday. Victims of the abuse are taking legal action to force a full independent inquiry with the power to compel witnesses to testify and the security service to hand over documents. The case in Belfast is the first over an alleged cover-up of the British state involvement in the Kinkora Children's Home in Northern Ireland in the 1970s. It is also the first of the recent sex abuse cases allegedly tying the British state directly. Victims allege that the cover-up over Kinkora has lasted decades. The victims want the claims of the state conclusion investigated to be an inquiry with its full powers, such as the one set up into other sex abuse scandals chaired by New Zealand judge Lyle Goddard. Amnesty International branded Concora as one of the biggest scandals of our age and back to the victims calls for an inquiry. There are long standing claims that MI5 blocked one or more police investigations into Concora in the 1970s in order to protect its own intelligence gathering operation which raises the spectre of countless vulnerable boys having faced further years of brutal abuse. In November 2014, the Daily Star reported that Babes in the Wood killer Ronald Jebson worked as a chauffeur ferrying innocent youngsters to be abused at sick orgies. The Daily Star tells us a former cellmate of Jepson's said the pervert boasted of his role in delivering children to be auctioned for abuse by high-ranking officials. Jepson, now 75, has spent the last 40 years in jail. He was convicted in 1974 of killing a friend's eight-year-old daughter and in 2000 confessed to strangling Susan Blatchford, 11, and her pal Gary Hallen who was 12 in 1970. The deaths were for years one of Britain's most notorious unsolved cases and Ronald Jebson became known as the Babes in the Wood Killer after he left their bodies huddled together in the woodland. The cellmate known as Billy to protect his anonymity said that he is speaking out now due to constant denials of a cover-up over a Westminster paedophile ring. He said that he was deliberately placed in the next cell to Jepson on Sea Wing at HMP Franklin near Durham about 15 years ago to extract further information about his past. Billy explained I was encouraged to get Jebson to talk about his past in return for favours and protection. We got to know each other quite well and chatted when our cell doors were open. One day I was being pressed by his crew to get him to talk. He hid around the corner to listen whilst I leant on the door frame. I couldn't believe it when Ronnie started blabbing. He said that he had worked for a luxury limousine company on the south side of London, he said that it was linked to the Westminster set and claimed they had all sorts of posh cars including Rolls Royces. He said the clients were all well-to-do, prominent people including politicians, 
but said they were also paedophiles. Ronnie said that many of the victims came from poor backgrounds. He said he often collected the children on a Friday and would take them to a large property in Surrey to London addresses or to a large house in the country that was owned by a lord. In July 2014, The Telegraph reported, Peter McAlvey, who worked on the conviction of paedophile Peter Wrighton, said there was a powerful elite of paedophiles who carried out the worst form of abuse. There is evidence linking former politicians to an alleged paedophile network, he said. Lord Warner, the former health minister, said the allegations were credible. Peter McAlvey triggered a police investigation in 2012 when he revealed there were seven boxes of potential evidence of a powerful paedophile network including letters between Wrighton and other paedophiles being stored by West Mercia Police. The former child protection manager in Hereford and Worcester said, I believe there is a lot of strong evidence and information that can be converted into evidence if it is investigated properly that there has been an extremely powerful elite amongst the highest levels of the political classes for as long as I have been alive. There has been sufficient reason to investigate it over and over again, certainly for the past 30 years, and there has always been a block and a cover-up to prevent that happening. I would say you are looking at upwards of 20 people and a much larger number of people who have known about it and done nothing about it, he said. The alleged abuse involved rape, beatings and being moved between paedophiles like a lump of meat. Lord Warner, the former Labour Health Minister, said the claims were possibly true. Children's Arm provided supply lines for child abuse and were targeted by people in power during the 1980s, he said. Sexual abuse of children is a power drive. That's what a lot of it is about. What I am suggesting is that it is possible that people who were authoritative, powerful, in particular communities, did sometimes have access to children's homes. I had to fire two managers of children's homes for abusing children in their care, he added. Charles Napier was a former treasurer of the Paedophile Information Exchange. The ex-teacher is said to have conducted a campaign of abuse at the school where he worked in the late 1960s and early 1970s, grooming and assaulting 21 victims as young as 8 years old. The Paedophile Information Exchange, also known as PI, was a British pro-paedophile activist group founded in October 1974 and officially disbanded in 1984. It was described by the BBC in 2007 as an international organisation of people who trade obscene material. In March 2014, evidence emerged that Pi had received grants totalling £70,000 from the Home Office after a whistleblower told police he witnessed a successful three-year grant renewal application for £35,000 in 1980, implying that a similar grant would had been made in 1977.
In October 2016, The Guardian reported that a former police superintendent has been found guilty of sexually abusing boys in the 1980s at a home attendance centre for young offenders and at a children's home. Gordon Angles, 79, becomes the highest profile offender brought to justice through the National Crime Agency's Operation Patio, which has been investigating allegations of widespread organised child abuse in North Wales. Judge Gavin Walters gave Anglesey bail but made it clear that he would be jailed when he is sentenced next month before leaving court. The judge said the defendant, a father of five, would have to sign the sex offenders register. Angles had faced claims for a quarter of a century that he had preyed on young boys and in the mid 1990s was awarded £375,000 in damages after successfully suing news organisations that linked him with abuse. In October 2008, the Daily Mail reported a former Buckingham Palace butler has been unmasked as a sexual predator who ran a paedophile ring while serving the royal family. The poor kid was given an indeterminate sentence and will serve a minimum of six years after admitting 29 counts of abuse on three young boys over a 32 year period. Bachelor poor kid groomed at least one of his teenage victims for sex by taking him for tea with the Queen Mother at Clarence House, it had emerged. To the public he had been an urbane gent who waited on the royals for nine years, first the Queen at the palace and then her mother. He often publicly gushed about his blue blood employers, talking of the Queen as courteous and genuinely caring. But behind the facade, Kid was leading a secret double life as a serial child abuser who molested a string of boys over a 30 year period. He was finally exposed after one of his victims read a newspaper article which he boasted about his links to the royals and talked fondly of Princess Diana and her musical tastes. Police raided his two bedroom home in St John Street, Stallybridge where they found almost 19,000 pornographic pictures and videos of children. Pork had admitted to 29 sex charges involving three boys, namely indecent assault, sexual activity with a child and possessing and making indecent images of children between December 1974 and January 2008. An accomplice David Hobday of St John Street Duncanfield admitted to seven charges involving one of the victims of sexual activity with a child and possessing indecent images. Both men face a maximum of 14 years in prison. A police source said that Kidd was a very accomplished groomer of children. As with all these stories, the media present the culprit as if he was acting alone living a secret double life as a paedophile ringleader and royal butler. The Sun newspaper often call out paedophiles and attack soft justice as if they are outraged by what is taking place, but The Sun or any other mainstream media outlet in Britain failed to properly inform the British people of a vote in Parliament in 2015. There was a proposal suggested by Labour MP John Mann 
This proposal would have granted immunity from prosecution under the Official Secrets Act of whistleblowers, many of whom claimed to have been blackmailed and threatened to remain silent. The proposal was defeated in the House of Commons by 295 votes to 233. Only eight Conservative politicians voted in favour to change the law to protect the whistleblowers. The other 254 and 40 Liberal Democrats should be forced to explain why they voted against exposing the truth. In February 2017, The Express reported one of Britain's most influential paedophiles was the head of the Masonic Lodge founded and frequented by GCHQ spies. Alan Wright was once a Grand Master in the secretive organisation and would have been present at the meetings attended by Prince Michael of Kent. He could now face jail when he appears at Ipswich Crown Court for sentencing next month. The maximum term for incitement is 10 years. Suffolk Police set up a sting after gathering intelligence on Wright's private life with specialist officers pretending to be a child online. Wright thought he was communicating with a 14 year old boy and sent him pictures of his private parts over the internet. Through a gay dating app grinder, he arranged to meet the boy at Berry St Edmunds Railway Station, Suffolk, last November. However, when Wright arrived, he was met by officers who took him to the local police station for questioning. A former Grand Master at the Grand Council of Royal and Select Masters, Wright regularly attended meetings at Freemasons Hall in St James Street, London. He has been described as a significant figure in the organisation. Sources say that he would have attended some meetings with Prince Michael, who was a popular Freemason, but the men were not friends. A spokesman for the United Grand Lodge of England says, We were made aware of an allegation against a Freemason on the 1st of December 2016, who immediately resigned from the organisation. Having learned of the situation, we have no further information currently, and we believe that this is a one-off isolated incident. Keith Harding was a former membership secretary of the Paedophile Information Exchange. He was made Worshipful Master of the Mercurius Lodge in Cheltenham, Gloucestershire in 2011. The child molester who died in 2014 proceeded over ceremonies and rituals from an all-night throne. Harding was convicted of an indecent assault against four children aged 8 and 9 in 1958, classified a Schedule 1 offender which meant the offence remained on his criminal record for all of his life. His name was also on a list of 400 Pi members seized by the police in 1984, the year the organisation disbanded. The Sunday Express revealed how Harding met Civil Smith and Leon Britton in the 1980s where he ran a North London antique store. 35 years ago he appeared alongside paedophile television presenter Jimmy Savile in a Christmas special of Jim or Fix It. The lodge boasts of the government's communications headquarters heritage on its website. A source close to Harding revealed that the lodge is known as the Spies Lodge because it was set up by the GCHQ 
and over the years many intelligence officers had become members. These are people trained to find out sensitive information and yet none of them had any idea of Keith's background and past convictions. They even voted him in the highest honour by making him the worshipful master. Keith felt the Freemasons were somewhere that he finally belonged. He called them his brotherhood. When he died last year, he arranged his funeral to make sure that the ceremony started at midday because the time apparently has significance with Masonic ritual. The Lodge declined to comment on the incident. Detectives probing the historical sexual abuse allegations revealed that they are investigating 1,433 suspects including 135 from the entertainment industry, 76 politicians, 7 sportsmen and 43 from the music industry. Another isolated incident involving Freemasons and paedophilia was reported by the Daily Star in November 2012. Keith Gregory suffered from two years of mental, physical and sexual abuse at Brynestin Children's Home. Mr Gregory, a counsellor in Wrexham, said he was regularly driven out of his home by staff to a hotel where he was sexually assaulted. He claimed up to 13 other victims had committed suicide. Mr Gregory told BBC Radio 5 Live that he is convinced the abusers escaped justice through their Masonic loyalty. He said most of them were Freemasons. There were two MPs, senior judges, serving police officers, senior police officers, market traders, business people from Wrexham, but there were people from all over Britain. One MP was a Conservative, but I'm not sure of the other. He added everyone at Brunestin used to cry themselves to sleep every night. Other Masonic suspicions include Stephen Walker, the co-author of Safeguarding Children and Young People, a guide to integrated practice. In July 2014 he wrote an article for the Morning Star he writes, the establishment is getting jittery as more evidence of organised cover-ups of paedophile MPs emerges on a regular basis. The Anglican Baroness Butler Slouse, appointed by the Armed Secretary to lead the overarching inquiry into the child protection which broadened the scope of the inquiry away from Parliament, resigned after she admitted that she had covered up the sexual abuse of two small boys by Anglican priests in a previous inquiry. It has since emerged that her brother, the former Attorney General Michael Havers, limited the scope of the inquiry into paedophile abuse at Kenkorius Children's Home in Northern Ireland in the 1970s. Chief constables from 1340s are now conducting at least 21 criminal investigations. Simon Bailey, the chief constable of Norfolk, who was running a national task force targeting VIP paedophiles, said that 30 senior officers involved in investigating MPs, peers and other prominent figures were now coordinating their work. The new police inquiries cover the whole country. These are allegations against elected officials, celebrities, people of public prominence and people directly connected to them. There is growing evidence that the establishment may be getting rattled at the amount of information pouring into the public domain about the role of senior political, religious and judicial figures in protecting paedophiles linked to parliament. Government whips are the latest to admit knowing 
about the child sexual abuse scandal by MPs, but doing nothing about it while shredding incriminating papers. The article goes on to claim that Civil Smith was a Freemason. Smith was a member of a Freemason's Lodge in Rochdale and this newspaper is continuing to investigate whether Freemasons within the establishment actively covered up criminal actions in order to protect their brothers. The Morning Star has yet to receive a response to a request to the Masonic Lodge in Rochdale, Liberty Lodge 5573, confirming whether Smith was a member and who were the senior officers between 1970 and 1990. The new Welcome Lodge number 5139 is a British Masonic Lodge based in the Palace of Westminster, open to all MPs and peers. Hundreds of MPs currently appear in the Masonic Yearbook, along with the names of judges, senior police commanders and top Whitehall servants. The role of Freemasonry in protecting paedophile MPs is yet to be fully established, but the suspicions will not go away. In July 2015, the Herald reported For Esther Baker, the idea of the existence of a paedophile ring involving some of the most rich and powerful people in Britain is not surprising. From the age of six, she suffered years of sexual abuse, including rape at the hands of a number of men, including two British politicians, she says. Despite the obvious she has suffered, she is shocked to learn that there were people in power who were aware of such abuse but failed to stop it. I knew it was happening from my own experience, Baker told the Sunday Herald. I was relieved to find out I wasn't on my own, that I wasn't the only person who was ready to come forward and speak about it. What struck me is when I found out how many people knew it was happening. It didn't shock me, it had happened. It shocked me that people were aware of it. Baker from Merseyside was one of the victims who spoke out on a documentary by Australian Current Affairs programme 60 Minutes, which reported sexual abuse carried out in Britain by past and current members of parliament, judges, diplomats and some of the nation's highest officials against hundreds of young victims over the past four decades. The notion of a paedophile ring involving influential members of society and preying on children is horrific, but increasingly evidence is coming to light which backs campaigners who have long tried to warn of an establishment cover-up as well. Previously secret government files relating to child abuse allegations named a number of high profile individuals including Home Secretary Leon Britton. The documents also revealed MI5 had known about an unnamed MP suspected of child abuse in the 1980s but dropped the inquiry when the politicians said the claims were false. A note by then director MI5 Sir Anthony Duff concluded the risks of political embarrassment to the government is rather greater than the risk of security. The day of Jimmy Savile's funeral thousands of people celebrated the life of a man that destroyed thousands of lives. The day after his funeral, the Daily Mail reported. In the homily, it was said that Jimmy Savile can face eternal life with confidence. Thousands of mourners line the streets as 700 people pack into the cathedral. Broadcasting icon will be buried 
in North Yorkshire seaside of Scarborough. Porters at Leeds Infirmary, where Jimmy Savile worked as a volunteer, showed their respects for the funeral procession. He had planned every detail of his funeral, made sure family and friends were all there and left precise instructions for his extraordinary send-off. With cheers and applause, the veteran DJ and ceaseless charity funder was seen off the premises as he once phrased it with a remarkable show of affection. Part of the city centre in his beloved Leeds was brought to a standstill as he did a final lap of his past. The modest house where he grew up, his mother's home and hospitals where countless ordinary folk benefited from his various good deeds. The Daily Mail and the rest of the mainstream media presented Jimmy Savile as if he was a national treasure. They would claim that this was a mistake that was made due from them not knowing what Jimmy Savile was doing, but can that be true? Of course they knew, or they had at least heard the rumours, the journalists, and they still decided to glorify him and the events. It was probably the final insult for many of his victims. According to the Guardian newspaper, the Sun newspaper was ready to expose Jimmy Savile before he died. So it's undeniable that certain people at the Sun knew what Jimmy Savile was like. The Sun have since removed the article about Jimmy Savile's funeral from their website. Like Jimmy Savile, Cyril Smith was perceived as an evil by the British public and this is again due to the fact that the mainstream media presented him as an evil. The BBC reported his funeral like this. Wonderful man. His friend Lord Walton said he received a letter from Sir Cyril after his death telling him he must read a poem. Death is nothing at all. He was a brilliant political organiser, he told his congregation after reading the Canon Henry Scott Holland poem. He was a remarkable man, a wonderful man and a great friend and we shall miss him greatly. According to Simon Hughes, the deputy leader of the Liberal Democrats, the politician commanded huge affection within the party. Speaking after the service, he says, when I got elected as a youngest Liberal MP, he became an uncle figure, offering advice, being there to say, that's good lad, or telling me off and putting me on the right lines. He was somebody who gave people tough love. He knew that sometimes if you were to benefit, he had to give you a talking to. But he had really clear, high standards and principles. But above all, he remembered he came from Rochdale and was in politics to help people from the bottom to the narrow the gap between the rich and the poor and to make Britain a fairer place. So Cyril was knighted in 1988 and awarded an MBE in 1966. He also served as mayor of Rochdale. He retired from Westminster in 1992. When the BBC reported his 80th birthday bash, in which Nick Clegg passes his best wishes to the well-known paedophile at the time. You were a beacon for our party in the 70s and 80s and continue to be an inspiration for the people of Rochdale and many of us.
Local party officials have also set up a birthday tribute page on social media network website, Facebook, for people to leave their best wishes, the BBC also reported. Daily Mirror do mention the child abuse allegations in this article, but I noticed that this article was updated in 2012. I would not be surprised if the original article had no reference to the sexual abuse allegations at all. The article reads, The man who brought a wider dimension to the role of celebrity MPs was being remembered as a rare political character last night. Cyril Smith, who died yesterday, aged 82, was a larger than life figure often billed as the biggest thing to come out of Rochdale since Gracie Fields. Born in the Lancashire town in 1928, he was a Liberal MP from 1972 until his retirement 20 years later. He became one of the best known MPs as much for his huge 25 stone girth as his flamboyant personality once described in Parliament as the longest running farce in Westminster. Liberal Democrat leader Nick Clegg paid a warm tribute to him last night, but some will recall Sir Civil Smith had a darker side. He had faced calls to be stripped from his knighthoods over his dealings with asbestos producer Turner and Nill. The Daily Mirror's Kevin McGrath, who brought the story, said, I shed no crocodile tears. Civil Smith was in the pocket of the asbestos industry. The fatal fibres were killing his constituents. Instead of standing up for them, the Liberal MP asked bosses to write his speeches in the House of Commons. Smith was not just unrepentant. When I confronted him with the evidence a couple of years ago, he was brazen. No wonder a dozen MPs later demanded he should lose his knighthood. And then, of course, there are the sexual abuse allegations that swelled around Smith. I don't know the truth and hesitate to repeat them when he's just died. But I note that Civil Smith did not sue when they surfaced in print 31 years ago. Apparently The Sun did not report the story or have since removed their report on his funeral as the story cannot be found on their website. Downing Street seems very reluctant to investigate claims of an elitist paedophile ring that many claims run through the Houses of Commons and the Houses of Lords. In fact, three of the last four Prime Ministers have been reported as either covering up the scandal or in David Cameron's case, completely dismissing it as a conspiracy theory. David Cameron once stated that he was bothered that an investigation into the claims could potentially turn into a witch hunt against gay politicians. In October 2016, The Independent reported Theresa May faces claims of a cover-up after she admitted knowing about concerns over the child abuse inquiry weeks before any official action was taken to address them. About the troubled probe when she was Home Secretary but that it had been impossible for her to act on hearsay. It follows a string of resignations from the inquiry into historic child abuse allegations including Dame Lyle Goddard who quit earlier this month amid concerns about her own professionalism and competence. Downing Street had said the first Miss May officially knew about the concerns was in late December but inquiry staff revealed issues were raised with the Home Office months earlier. After being confronted with the new information Number 10 officials admitted Theresa May knew about the concerns when she was still Home Secretary some weeks before the end of July. Following the revelation, 
Labour MP Lisa Nandy said, For far too many child abuse survivors cover up secrecy institutions that act in denial will be far too familiar. And I'm not the first person to say that this feels like a cover up. In fact, there are a number of child abuse survivors who have been involved in the inquiry who are voicing their concerns as well. Speaking to Sky News, she added, if Theresa May is serious about allowing the truth to emerge for people to have confidence in this inquiry, then she needs to come clean about what she knew and when she knew it. In July 2015, the Daily Mail reported, one November day in 1998, a group of officials from Lambeth Council found themselves in an upstairs meeting room at Mary Sokol House, a concrete office block in South London. It was the end of a lengthy business meeting and they were sitting in stunned silence. The reason, a few moments earlier, a local police inspector had just delivered several pieces of earth-shattering news. First he revealed that the detectives working on Operation Trawler, an investigation into a paedophile ring suspected of operating in the London boroughs, children's homes were focusing their inquiries on 12 potential abusers. Second, it was prepared to name these people. Third, it contained the names of several high members of the establishment. On condition of confidentiality, the policeman read out the list of the people his team were pursuing. One was a Lambeth councillor, another was a household name celebrity, a third, perhaps most explosively, was a minister in Tony Blair's government. These are all only suspects at this stage, the policeman says bullishly. But I have reason to believe that further investigation will produce evidence that I can use to pursue court cases. On the 20th of February 2017, the Daily Mail printed this strange story on ex-British Prime Minister Edward Heath. The story claims a group of women who say they were abused by Edward Heath also claim their parents ran a satanic sex cult that was involved in 16 child murders. They say that the court regularly slaughtered children as ritual sacrifices in the church. The woman claims that the former Prime Minister was part of a paedophile ring. If the allegations are true, it will make the court the worst child murderers in British history. A group of women who say Edward Heath had abused them as children have also accused their parents of being involved in up to 16 murders. The Daily Mail tells us the farce came as police probe incredible claims that the former Prime Minister was linked to a paedophile ring that killed as many as 16 children, which would make them the worst child murderers in British history. The seemingly far-fetched allegations have been made by a family who allege that the politician was part of a satanic sex cult run by their own parents. They say that the cult regularly slaughtered children as ritual sacrifices in churches and forests around southern England and also participated in similar ceremonies in Africa. They claim their mother and father, who is said to have known the former Conservative leader, were responsible for slaughtering children ranging from babies to teenagers, yet they evaded justice. The paedophile ring, which they say Edward Heath was a part of, stabbed, tortured and maimed youngsters in churches and burnt babies in satanic orgies before men, women and children gorged themselves on blood and body parts, the police were told. But there is no suggestion that Sir Edward killed any children himself in the women's accounts. If the bizarre allegations were proved to be true, the parents who allegedly 
that the killings would be responsible for murdering more children than Fred and Rose Mary West. Sir Edward's godson, Lincoln Seligan, said, I understand that these claims from the 1980s were at the time dismissed as complete fantasy by the police. It is disappointing that these wild allegations would have been reheated and randomly attached to Edward Heath's name. Wiltshire Police Constable Michael Veal claimed he was 120% sure that Edward Heath was a paedophile. He said the allegations against the late politician, which include loving tales of satanic child slaughter, are totally convincing.